in this video, um, something exciting to share with you guys. So next week, I'm going to visit Hesea Coffee and the Guatemalan coffees have landed. So I think last time I mentioned that a lot of the coffee, there was another coffee that I was going to pick up, but they've been delayed. And um, Hase has been doing these great emails, or Jared in particular, really updating and really being a lot more informative, educational about what they have in stock, which is fantastic. I love to see them grow. So we have a list here of Guatemalan coffees that are ready to go, ready to be shipped. And what's different about this email is his SEA cupping scores, right? We talked about the difference of uh, my mistake of like trying to just for the content sake or just for not being for being naive or whatever it may be but mistakenly like saying a score of a coffee when i'm not certified to score it that way whereas i could say something like oh this coffee's a four out of five or a it's a two or you know two out of three or something like that right so I love that either he watched my video or we're on the same wavelength, but he's like SEA 84.38. That's his score, right? So being really distinguishable in terms of signifying the importance of what this score is and what it means and not, you know, confusing it with anything else. <laughs> so I love that. If you watch the video or not, whatever, I love it. Um, so yeah, we're going to take a look at all these uh, Guatemalans. And what is cool is that he invites those who are wholesale, I think buyers, or even anybody, I think, to come into the shop and um, cup so you can test them out and see which ones you want. So I was like, dude, there's so many here on the docket. And I think it would be really educational for me to just come back in there and um, cup with him again, like I did before. And now I think that was uh, last year. And so it's always really smart to cup with other people, especially if they're a lot more qualified than you are. There's just so many little things that you pick up. I will bring my phone to film a little something, something, uh, but I will try to be learning and seeing what the differences are. So um, there's a couple here just based on his descriptions here that I think I may be interested in. Um, but another thing in this video that I wanted to do that I think would be cool and fun is to find out more about Guatemalan coffee. So for some reason, not been looking at Guatemala, maybe because I've just been so interested in, um, natural coffees and a lot of Guatemalan coffees are actually washed or wet process. And, uh, just to make sure, you know, um, I found all these links, but, uh, I'll drop them in the in the description if you're interested uh, but wet you'll you'll sometimes see that like they call it a certain process like the farmers of that country of origin will call it something so they'll call it wet process but we may be familiar with the term washed like ethiopians african coffees use the term washed right but they're the same you know so if you were wondering about that with washed if you didn't know about that they're basically washing the cherry the fruit off of the seed of the coffee and using water to like get rid of that um, that mucilage for a different flavor in the cup. And so the biggest difference is that I I think sometimes have like come to and I and this is something that I want to test again when I go in um, and cup with Jared is like the differences that I can pick up now being a little bit more further along in my journey, the differences between a washed and a natural. But to me right now, without going into the cupping room with Jared would be like, naturals are uh, more fruitier, I would, I would say, maybe more jammy, I guess, in terms of flavor. And then a washed cup is cer certainly just more clean, or maybe a little bit lighter. Uh, but Guatemalan coffees are, are said to be have really good body, which, you know, that's, that's why I really fell in love with Guatemalan coffees in the first place. So I'm just going to read this brief history of Guatemalan coffee from coffeeofthenorth.org. Despite the unparalleled reputation of the country when it comes to coffee, the coffee plant isn't native to Guatemala, nor brought to them to manufacture it into a drink. The existence of coffee trees in Guatemala dates back to the mid 1700s when Jesuit missionaries brought coffee trees as ornamental plants. Back then, the primary industry of Guatemala relies on indigo and cochineal dye. Did I say that correctly? Come in the mid 1800s, the invention of synthetic dyes left the Guatemalan economy devastated. 
As a response, the government began searching for an alternative way to revamp the economy. And that's when the coffee plant comes in. Coffee plantations were widely established throughout the years. By the late 1800s, the country's economy boomed as Guatemalan farms started refining their craft and exporting coffee beans. The nation established an excellent reputation for high quality, strong, full-bodied coffee. Up until 2011, the country consistently ranked as one of the world's top five coffee producers and exporters in the world. Presently, alongside the farmers cultivating, harvesting, and exporting coffee beans for a living, Coffee is a central export for product for Guatemala, with over 130,000 coffee producers driving the industry. Coffee represents 40% of all agricultural exports in Guatemala and remains one of the country's major sources of revenue despite some recent downturns due to natural disasters. Wow, interesting. So coffee replaced dye in terms of a main, like, a country export and moneymaker by coming from a single country is attributed to its ideal growing conditions. Each coffee plantation in the country located in different regions has its own diverse climate and soil. That's called microclimate. Yeah, the currently recorded microclimates in Guatemala are over 300 among various regions. 300 microclimates. That means 300 types, (laughs) 300 x right 300x times all the little you know changes that can happen to coffee plus fermentation experiments so exciting the country also experiences a largely tropical climate with a lengthy wet season thus the wet process right or washed process it's just like hey we've got the water bro Combined with its natural high elevation and terrain, it makes an ideal coffee growing condition that produces some of the most delicious coffee beans available. Guatemala benefits from high altitudes. The country features an average elevation of 1,600 to 16,400 feet above sea level, depending on the region. Today, 20 out of 22 departments continue producing coffee, and Guatemala's total coffee farming area is around 270,000 hectares, which is about 98% shade grown. Depending on the region, overall temperatures range from 60 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Guatemala boasts special sections of volcanic and mountain rainforests that are still found near agricultural plots where the plants grow wild and abundantly. While Guatemalan coffee producers focus on Arabica varieties grown at high altitudes in the highlands, farmers are struggling to keep the high quality Bourbons, Caturas, and Catuai varieties free of disease because the coffee rust is now well established up to 1600 meters above sea level. Interesting. So coffee rust, you know, which is like a coffee disease, it basically turns all the leaves to like a rusty color. Um, basically disintegrating it, I think, is is maybe like a good term. Each coffee plantation in Guatemala has its own way of processing coffee beans that matches the conditions. Yeah, makes sense. However, the majority of Guatemalan coffee goes through a method called the wet process because other methods just aren't suitable for the country's climate. Yeah, it's raining all the time. Coffee processing starts once the beans are harvested. The typical harvest time around November to April. Okay. November to April. So we may be getting some really, we're getting some really fresh coffee if we, you know, if we end up buying. While the wet process produces excellent coffee, the amount of resources that it takes is astronomical. In a wet milling process, it could use up to more than 1,200 liters of water for every 100 weight bag of harvested coffee cherry. Once the whole process is complete, that amount can only be produced as little as 16 pounds of market-ready coffee beans. What? (laughs) 1,200 liters of water producing 16 pounds of market-ready coffee. I mean, coffee margins, the process is just, every time you read about it, you're just like, you're so humbled. (laughs) You're so grateful that you get to drink this beverage partake every day in this coffee and this coffee in particular is from Burundi tomorrow can be from Guatemala next day could be from Nicaragua the next day Mexico whatever and that is amazing and I'm very grateful for that Guatemalan coffee is known to be one of the best tasting coffee in the world 
It is a result that can be credited to the com- country's ideal growing conditions, as well as the refined techniques the, mark- the farmers use in processing the coffee beans. In general, Guatemalan coffee has a distinct flavor that is rich with a medium to full body. Body, so important. The aroma is also centered on being fruity rather than acidic. The wet method used by the farmers produce beans with cleaner color compared to other coffee beans on the market. Mm, color. The color of the beans is also a tribute to having a higher degree of quality. When you see washed coffee in general, that's sorted well, it's just pretty, right? It's kind of shiny a little bit, you know? Like it was polished in a rock polisher. <laughs> However, the true taste of Guatemalan coffee depends on the growing regions and where the coffee beans were grown and produced. Guatemala's mountains provide a range of soil types and atmospheres that promote coffees with fruit characteristics, as well as naturally sweet coffees with body and flavor notes such as chocolate or caramels. Ah, chocolate and caramel. We never tired of those, right? The eight growing regions of Guatemala. Okay, cool. So we're get, there's eight of them, but maybe we can focus on the two that are most popular. The Antigua, I'm uh, probably saying that wrong, sorry. And then the Jujutenango. Okay, this was like my favorite. Like when I saw that, <laughs> I was like, I'm getting it. All right, so let's read about the Antigua region. For most people, the best type of Guatemalan coffee is produced in the Antigua region. Besides being the best known coffee growing region, Antigua is a city in the central highlands of Guatemala. Central highlands. Let's, let's take a look. Antigua, all right. You see that? It's right here. Isn't that cool? Antigua is a small city surrounded by volcanoes in southern Guatemala. It's renowned for its Spanish colonial buildings. Let's take a gander. Very, very, very Spanish. Surrounded by volcanoes. Dude, it would be a dream to capture a wedding here. Coax me out to shoot. <laughs> out of retirement once again. Very beautiful. Look at that. Wow. Okay, so... The volcanoes in this region made the soil incredibly rich in nutrients and fertile for growing coffee. And the (laughs) Asatanago, sorry, (laughs) primarily made the right terrain for soil deposits for growing, for coffee growing, and the active Fuego volcano continues to provide new minerals. So there's, it's erupting all the time. Jesus, it must have been that guy right there in the background, isn't it? This guy. Combined with the consistent temperature and constant rain in the central highlands, Antigua became one of the leading regions in Guatemala coffee production. Wow. Let's read about this one because I see it everywhere. Why? It's a region located west of Guatemala. Let's find it. So in relation to... Here's Jujutenango. Or Huehuetenango. <laughs> I'm sorry, Katrina. it. All right. There that is. Very pretty. Very rural versus Antigua, which is a little bit more developed. Let's take a look. Wow. Okay. Definitely more rural. I hope these are all accurate photos. The region is the highest and driest non-volcanic location in the country with an altitude of more than 2,000 meters above sea level. Huehuetenango, I think that's better pronunciation, still receives warm winds coming from Mexico's borders, which makes the soil quite saturated and ideal for producing Guatemalan coffee. Okay, so... This will be interesting because we're going to look at two coffees from those two regions, right? So we have Antigua, Washed, his personal favorite, scoring 86.25. And then we have Awewe Tenango, Washed, 85.88. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So this is why it's helpful to like, man, it's fun to dig into where the coffee's coming from, looking at the terroir, Terroir was a big thing Mike was kind of like obsessed about from Clatch. He was always talking about terroir and microclimates and very, very nerdy on that stuff because to let you know as a buyer what's going to be worth your money, you know, the things need to match up, you know, when you're buying coffee.
And um, while it's really exciting to just buy coffee and be like, you know, if I knew nothing and I just looked at this list, which that's kind of what I'm, <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at, where I'm like, oh, Jesus, like, let's break this down. Okay, where is it from? Okay, Palencia. Okay, what's the process? Okay, what's the tasting notes? Okay, what was, you know, Jared's score? All right. Is it the best value? You know, as a buyer, you have to ask yourself that and be like, he says it's the best value. But in order for you to buy confidently and buy consistently again and again and again, and to keep you know growing as a roaster, as a green buyer, as a cupper, we need to know why. Why is it the best value? And when we do find out why, does it match where it's coming from, the tasting notes, the score? Do they all line up? Because if there's something that's off, say if this score was 87, and then maybe it's you're only getting maple syrup, caramel, milk, chocolate, orange. You're like, I don't know. That sounds kind of, I know, th- th- not not to be harsh or whatever, but it sounds basic. These, from my knowledge, maple syrup, caramel, milk, chocolate, orange, cinnamon, clove, floral, bright, kind of like basic good descriptors, but kind of on the sweet side, right? Scoring lower than, say, this one, dark chocolate, black tea, milky, like a London fog. We got to look that up. I don't know what that is. Caramel, lavender, lime zest, green apple acidity, 8625. And then, as you learn, what does 8625 versus 8438 actually mean? What does those two points mean, right? In coffee, it's a big deal but you have to know why. (laughs) And that's the big fun of it all, right? You go, why? It's only two points or whatever it is, right? So uh, learning these things, all this stuff, all this nuance, you'll know why eventually. (laughs) Or you'll begin to start to understand why. And that is the fun of coffee. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm going to drop all these cool links in the... um, Uh, But learning why, basically, learning why you're buying, I think is important and fun and a cool journey that can lead you into learning something else that could make everything better in your process, in your systems, in your roasting, in your cupping, um, and even meeting somebody. Because like me going to Hasea, it's not just me going to Hasea to cup. It's also me kind of like nurturing this relationship that I have with Hasea. You know, I could choose to not go always. I could always choose to not go. But to be a part of coffee is to be a part of it. (laughs) And even though like my introverted self is always like shy or whatever it is, right? Um, Uncomfortable, socially awkward and anxious. A lot of the time, I'm just always like, oh, but the coffee... (laughs) calls to me so I get over all that and I and I try to go uh, and I try to force myself to go because when I get there it's always a good time but but uh, as, like a lot of things getting started can be difficult so I'm 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 glad I'm putting it on camera you know it's stakes you're making it real for myself like hey get out of your home get out of your head a little bit you have a lot of stuff going on but come out come and cup these coffees learn the difference again learn the lessons again you may be Uh, getting more nuanced and deeper understandings of these lessons, even though you, you revisit basics again, because say you took, say you took a, a a cupping course. Cause I'm thinking about going to uh, just signing up for another cupping course again, the same one, I don't care, (laughs) you know, but just because I know I didn't absorb every single thing when I first went to one of Jared's cupping courses, uh, classes, um, So I know that going again will still benefit me, will still be fun just to talk to other coffee people, right? And to just get out, get out there, get out of my home and um, stop working and get back into coffee again. So yeah, that's what's going on. Thanks for hanging out and learning a little bit about Guatemalan coffee. I hope that it's interested you to dig a little deeper into if it's Guatemalan coffee, cool, but maybe it's like, dang, I don't know anything about Nicaragua. Let's, you know, and I have it in my, uh inventory or have it in stock and i don't really even know the region or where it comes from or why it's like that or they they say it's got a good microclimate but what does that mean oh it means that on this side 
from, you know, from uh, these weeks, it's shaded and rainy and crazy. And on these weeks, it's drier and uh, the sea, sea breeze comes in or some crap. <laughs> and that's why I produce this fantastic tasting coffee. Cool. Now I know why. All right. Anyway, good things. Uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.